Good evening, everybody, and thanks for staying, notwithstanding the late hour. I wish to thank, uh, first of all, the previous speaker, because uh, he already prepared uh, my talk in an excellent way and in many points. That will save me some time. Uh, most of all, I want to thank uh, my colleague Silvio Salvi. He's not mentioned here, because, but he will be acknowledged at the end, because he couldn't make it here. So I'm filling in for him. So any questions that I cannot answer, well, next time you catch up with Silvio, ask him. All right. So we're talking about uh, cloning root mutants in uh, barley using tilling uh, material. Uh, that's a similarity also with the previous talk. And uh, I do not have to go through too many details because the previous speaker very uh, clearly showed how basically we have two root systems in, uh, in wheat and also in barley. Uh, a seminal system and the more adult uh, that develops from uh, crown shoots. And they may have different roles and different plasticity. And I think it was very important, the comment that you made, particularly under uh, abiotic stress condition drought, uh, they may have very important roles in different ways. Uh, there has been uh, some uh, increase in the literature in terms of publication on native variation for root traits. Uh, later, as this has already been mentioned by the previous speaker, there is uh, the work of um, uh, Lee Iki and his colleagues that cloned the first uh, QTL for root angle. We are working on root angle as well in, uh, in durum wheat, and we are trying, we will hopefully have some clone the QTL soon. One point that I want to make, mutant-based uh, root genetics in uh, 3TC. Uh, we have a lot of information on transcriptomic. Several thousands of genes have uh, been shown to be expressed in roots. The root QTL ohm is becoming more and more populated, particularly in wheat, not so much in barley. However, so far, uh, no collection of root architecture mutants is available in barley and 3TC, except the one that we have just heard about it and is being characterized. All rules have their exceptions, so uh, there are collection of root hair mutants. Um, Ivona Zareiko and um, uh, with uh, Rasmussen, they, um, they selected the identify root hair mutants. And the few root morphology mutants have been described by um, Forster and by uh, White in uh, cultivar optic. Uh, there is only one barley uh, mutant described in barley genetics newsletter. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, no more seed is available for this, um, for this uh, mutant. Uh, in rice, we have a, a rather large number of um, mutants, about 100, but only a few tens in Brachypodium and only 10 in May. So there is a lack of mutants. And many speakers have alluded to the complexity of root architecture. And this is true, but one way to deconvolute this complexity is to use mutants in this uh, task. So our objectives were to produce a collection of root architecture mutants in barley and also to set up a forward genetics protocol for fast cloning of root mutants. And at the end of my talk, I hope to convince you that uh, what is a disadvantage in wheat, namely too many uh, mutants, because it's a polyploid, in barley, which, is, which behaves more as a diploid species, becomes an advantage because it has a much smaller number of mutants as compared to wheat. And therefore, using bulk segregate analysis, we can go much faster to the uh, candidates. Our material was Tillmore, a tilling population. Why Tillmore? Uh, tilling from uh, Morex. And the reason we choose Morex about 12 years ago, because already at that time, Morex was becoming uh, the key uh, model species for those uh, working in, uh, in barley. In as much as recently uh, Morex has been uh, sequenced, uh, a high quality assembly has been put together by Neil Stein and collaborators. So now we have the whole sequence available. And this is great advantage, particularly if you want to do tilling. 
Uh, we have about uh, 300 and 500 uh, M5 lines, originally much more, but a few of these uh, had very low uh, germination. We have tilled in the reverse fashion uh, 19 genes, but this is a rather tedious and lengthy process. And uh, the number of knockouts, as you can see, is quite low, so the phenotypic effect is not so uh, substantial. We only had s seven uh, knockouts and 53 missed senses. Mutation frequency is what about uh, you expect uh, in other population in maize, in uh, barley, I apologize. Uh, one every 480 KB, so much smaller than the one in wheat, if I remember well, is one every 30 KB or something like that because of the polyploidy nature of wheat. So we estimate that we have about 10,000 mutations per line in approximately 60 exons. However, after many years of work uh, in a reverse fashion, we decided to go after our uh, collection in a different way, more in a forward genetics way, because the phenotypic uh, variation is really huge, is really um, astounding. We have about 37, 33% of the families that show the distinct phenotype by simple visual observation. We were also lucky to have Uda Lukwinst uh, coming to visit our uh, nursery. And this number is likely an underestimate of the real number of mutations that are present. So this is uh, what I call the KISS um, approach, keep it simple and smart. Like oh, we already saw, no Christmas uh, tray here, even more simple, just trays. And by the way, uh, this uh, is not a mutant. As you can see, this is maize. So, <laughs> because it happened to be there, a very effective mutation, right? So basically, we start our phenotyping with a paper roll um, uh, assay, uh, three reps for seedlings, so not a large number, and we see the consistency of uh, the phenotype. We go after what I call the elephants in the room. We're not looking at small differences in root architecture. We're looking for big differences. And then the next step, for those who give um, a promising uh, phenotype, we move to this uh, rhizotron, uh, also in this case with three reps, with a 45 uh, uh, degree uh, incline. Uh, this is some example to show you the kind of mutants that we get. Most of them are for the length of the root. Uh, some of, uh, sometimes are a little bit longer, not too many of these kind of mutants. Uh, most of them are shorter, as you would have expected, probably. Uh, some uh, present some sort of coiled, uh, twisted appearance. Uh, some are kind of uh, sclerified. Uh, the, we, we, do have see, uh, we, do, we have seen difference also in root numbers and in root hair. Um, this is uh, one example, mutant 485, uh, short and also with a larger number of uh, laterals a bit similar to what uh, you showed before. Uh, here we have a more uh, twisted appearance, more coiled uh, phenotype, and uh, also root hairs are, I don't know if you can see them, but they are uh, a little bit longer as compared to Morex. Morex is the wild type. Uh, this is a root hairless uh, phenotype. You probably cannot see it very well, but still you can see here the root hairs in Morex, but you cannot see in this mutant. Uh, this is one what we call uh, sclerified and probably has a sublethal effect because out of uh, heterozygote uh, you can obtain uh, these three different uh, um, phenotypes and uh, we, we are testing that we think we have the uh, domina the plus plus, the wild allele, the heterozygote and the homozygote and then we don't recover this in the field, so probably because they can't make it. Uh, these are the two examples of long root mutants. Uh, these are significantly different, uh, significantly uh, significant differences between Morex and uh, the mutants. And uh, next, we will go after this. Oops, what happened? Why is it going back? Okay. Okay, this is what we call uh, geotropic, uh, 
affecting root angle. This is Morex, and these are the mutants. They go straight down. And uh, this is the same kind of mutant. This image was um, done by our student, Ricardo Fusi, in Michael Bennett uh, lab in Nottingham. And you can see Morex, the wild type. Here you can see the uh, short uh, mutant uh, phenotype. And here you can see the geotropic. So this shows very well, and the point that was made previously, like a 3D uh, image can add uh, depth into the phenotype. So in summary, we went through 3,071 F4 uh, families. It took us almost a year and a half, so high throughput, but within certain uh, limits, of course. Uh, we identified the 63 families, uh, roughly 2%, with a reasonably strong uh, root phenotype. And uh, 27 are pretty much homozygote and fixed. Some of them are still in the heterozygote uh, state, mixed, probably because they have some lethal effect when they get to the, to the homozygote uh, state. 77% of the mutants were for uh, root length and then a smaller number for root hairs and root morphology. So quite a large array. Um, Mendelian inheritance in this case, um, those that we tested all showed uh, a single gene uh, genetic control, uh, chi-square test in F2 between uh, the cross between the mutant and proctor. We use Proctor because it's uh, two row varieties, and uh, Morex is the six row varieties. So, if there is any uh, misconduction of the uh, self of the cross um, in, uh, in Proctor, which is a two row, um, two row uh, bar barley, we will pick it up that rather quickly. Oh, by the way, the red, the red, um, the red. Um, arrow, they show the, the mutants. So a bit of uh, numbers. Uh, so we have about one SNP every 500 KB in Tilmore. And the barley genome is about 5 billion uh, base pair. And the induced mutation, like I told you before, are approximately 10,000. And the coding gene space is rather limited. We're talking about uh, less than 1%. And uh, the proportion of coding gene space in the genome is 0.6%. So why does it go back? Okay. Um, so we have uh, knockouts. Uh, we have figured that we have about one on two knockouts per genome. So a rather small number. And we have approximately one knockout per chromosome at the most. Why are we so interested in knockout? Because the knockout are the ones that give you a clear uh, genotype, phenotype. And therefore, a two-pronged approach based on coarse genetic mapping that we do with bulk fragrant analysis and the sequencing of the coding space of the mutant line in this case, allows us to zero in and focus very, very quickly, much more quickly than bread, because uh, bread wheat, because in bread wheat we also have to deal with the other uh, genomes. It allows us to hone in into the uh, key regions. And therefore, at this stage, the lower number of mutants uh, that we have in barley that can be perceived as an advantage compared to bread wheat, it becomes an advantage because the one or few mutations that we will find at the target locus, it tells us very quickly if that's a feasible candidate or not for our uh, phenotype. So this is an example of an exercise that we did with this uh, uh, mutant using uh, SMP-based uh, bulk segregant analysis. So out of the uh, segregating F2 uh, population, we bulked uh, the DNA of um, the mutant, uh, like um, 
seedlings, and uh, we did a bulk of the uh, of the wild type looking. And at the end, uh, at the SMPs that are uh, polymorphic, we can distinguish them pretty well. Okay, I have to move up. We get a very clear peak, as you can see, on chromosome seven, and then we zero in and. Uh, Okay, I can skip this. Uh, we zero in, and in this case, we had a very clear uh, mutation in the, the center of uh, the peak of, uh, of the uh, lot value. And in this case, we have uh, a mutation, a GA transition that gives a missense from uh, aspartic acids to asparagin. And this is predicted by the software to be highly deleterious. So uh, we believe that this is our uh, culprit. And uh, I should point out that this uh, allele is absent in uh, a collection of barley um, in the diversity panel. The um, a BLAST uh, analysis indicated that this um, sequence, that we got it from the Morex uh, uh, sequence, has a high similarity with the uh, PIN1 from Arabidopsis, so it makes it a very likely, uh, a very likely candidate. I don't understand, it keeps jumping back. And uh, this, is, um, this was also made by our student, Ricardo Fuzzi, in uh, Michael Bennett uh, lab. You can see in this case, uh, in the mutant, uh, we have here, we have the metaxylum uh, in the mutants, in our two mutants and in the wild type, and the, the proto-metaxylum some, shows some very different uh, morphology and phenotype. At the same time, also this uh, picture, uh, with calclo floors, white staining, shows a disruption of the uh, typical pattern of Morex, uh, wild type, compared to the one of the uh, two mutants. Um, last but not least, now we're looking also for uh, mutants in the root angle, like I showed you before. We have this, this is quite interesting. Uh, we called enhanced gavitropic uh, two. Uh, with a very different uh, root angle as compared to Morex, as you can see. So conclusions. Uh, our root mutant collection of 63 lines, which, by the way, it's open for collaboration. If you are interested in having and looking at these materials, not only for roots, but also for other traits, we are open for collaboration. Uh, so we got 63 lines with the clear uh, root phenotype, and uh, to our best... Uh, Understanding is the largest collection of uh, root mutants in monocots, uh, probably second to yours. I don't know how many you have. Uh, Mendelian inheritance was found most of the time, and uh, we have cloned um, uh, those two uh, mutants um, for um, um, short, short root, and uh, we believe that uh, the uh, pin uh, locus is involved in this. Um, so, bulk segregant analysis and whole genome sequence of the seven mutants have been completed now, and we plan to extend this uh, bioinformatic analysis also for uh, candidate genes of the other seven mutants. Um, so, I think I've shown you like a tool that was created for reverse genetics has turned into a good opportunity for forward genetics approach. And uh, we believe that given these three steps, step one, two, and three, uh, probably in the future we will be able to jump directly from step one to step three uh, using exome uh, sequencing. Uh, a key, key points are that the mutants are not too few, because we have none, we wouldn't be able to do anything, but also not too many, as in the case of bread wheat. And what we would like to do, which is something that the bread wheat people have already done, sequencing the whole collections, and the cost is estimated uh, to be about uh, $1,000 per uh, line. 
uh, many people to thank. Uh, of, your, of course, uh, most of the work uh, was done by Silvio Salvi, uh, helped by uh, many different of our students, uh, some of which have uh, been in the labs of Malcolm Bennett and uh, Neil Stein at IPK, and the also other collaborators like Ivona and Fred French or Scholdinger. And last but not least, uh, if you like pasta, uh, you are welcome to join our Congress in Bologna. We will be talking about roots here, I promise, uh, in September. So I look forward to seeing you, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.